I'm Brittany. And I'm Heather. Welcome to OKS Moms, the podcast. A place to be more than just mom. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. We are back with an episode all about matrescence. This is the first episode in our month of back to mom. We did back to school last month, and now we are back to our son's goddess. That's right. We kick these kids out, even though I'm back with these kids. But <laughs> that's a different. <laughs> it's a different thing. <laughs> At least I'm not your kids. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yes, that actually makes a very large difference. So this term matrescence is if you think like adolescence, it's you know like the change from child to like young adult. Matrescence is the change, the physical, emotional, hormonal, spiritual, like, spiritual. <laughs> change of a woman becoming a mother and this term was actually coined in the 70s but really hasn't come on my radar until recently but as soon as I heard it like every cell in my body understood it because it was like yeah Uh that's exactly what has happened to me over the last nine years and I still don't feel like I'm through matrescence but here we are anyway no, yeah. I feel the same way. It's so nice to like have a word to describe it because that I think just about every single mom can No, I'm going to say it. Every single mom can relate to that feeling that you are thrust into when you have your first child. It is just it's indescribable. I <laughs> think you like everything about your life changes. Down to like, I mean, just how you operate in the world and how you see the world. And I know it's been said so many times that our generation of mothers basically has to do everything alone. Like we're so isolated and everything. There's no village. There's no, no one's coming to save you. Like it's you figuring it out on your own. And of course you can assemble those things and find that support, but it's not built into our culture And I think the more we give a name to this feeling, I think that's what will bridge the gap of that isolation. I think the more we talk about this and identify it, I think more women will be able to identify it in themselves and come to expect it when they become a mother. And who knows, maybe as our children see us having these conversations, making these changes, that maybe it will just be commonplace for them when they're at this point. So that's that's the best way to make the change is to identify it. I hope so. Gosh. Oh, so our guest today is wonderful. And she kind of helps us dive in and kind of like kind of get down to the nitty gritty of not only just her experience, but, you know, experiences of all mothers. Her name is Heather as well. So I was just in a Heather sandwich for this episode. And she is the writer of Our Tiny Rebellions, which is a newsletter on Substack, and you should go subscribe to it right now. We'll have all those links in our show notes, and we'll take a quick break and be back with Heather. Get ready for this school year with Essential Calendar. Ready or not, the school year is just around the corner. Drop-offs, pickups, sports, lessons, activities, birthday parties. Oh, I'm tired just thinking about it. It's all coming back at once, and you're going to need a way to keep it all straight. Why not join the Essential Calendar Quarterly Calendar Club? You'll receive a new calendar automatically shipped to you every three months at a discounted subscription rate of 10% off. Each Essential Calendar allows you to see the entire season, all three months at a glance, making sure you don't overbook or underbook, depending on how many extroverts you have in your family. To get 10% off your subscription to the Essential Calendar Quarterly Calendar Club, go to okayismoms.com essential. With the busy back-to-school season just around the corner, there has never been a better time to try HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get everything you need to get dinner on the table delivered directly to your door. You choose the meals on their weekly menu, how many servings you'd like it to be, and they do the rest. No more trips to the grocery store or endless hours of meal planning because you can do it all in one step with HelloFresh. 
And if your plans change, you can easily skip a week on their super user-friendly app. OKS Moms listeners can get 18 meals free, which is 50% off your first four boxes, making the price per serving under $5. To get this deal, just click through the link in our show notes and complete your order. Hi, Heather. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. I am a recovering corporate attorney. I spent 12 years in corporate law. I've got two daughters who are seven and four, Hazel and Ruby. And even though I'm an attorney by trade, I consider myself a writer at heart. I've it, it's always been my passion. I was a journalism major in college and I wrote a book with my husband, who's a millennial finance expert called The Millennial Money Fix back in 2017, right after I actually gave birth to my first daughter. And now I have a newsletter called Our Tiny Rebellions, which examines anyone, but really it, it's really geared towards uh, women's like little wins and losses to try and realize bigger gains in our lives from them. And uh, it's just something that I deeply enjoy and gives my life a lot of meaning outside of what I do in the day-to-day -day working with my husband, which is what I do now full-time. I left corporate law last fall, and now I'm running his business affairs for his firm. Hey, right. So our episode today is all about matrescence, which is kind of, I feel like a newer term to our zeitgeist, but it's actually been around since the 70s. It was coined by anthropologist Dana Raphael. So it's this idea of, if you think of adolescence, that transition you go through it from like child into like young adult. And so matrescence is kind of this idea of your change into motherhood. So do you want to start by telling us a little bit about what that means and how or how you embody it? Well, I can tell you about my experience transitioning to motherhood. So I I'll start by saying this. I'm an only child and I'm a product of divorce. And it was an interest in that that occurred in the formative years of my tween life, like into, I was about 13 when that happened. And I spent a lot of time trying to sort out and figure out who I was and how to kind of like preserve myself in that experience. And some people would call it selfish. People love calling only children selfish, but, but it, it really was an act of self-preservation in those difficult years. And fast forward to when I had my first daughter, I think I was really impacted by the notion that I would need to make sacrifices for somebody else. I mean, and, and I don't say that as, as a selfish, I don't say that from a place of selfishness, just a place of like, it, it was antithetical to everything, to the body of armor I'd build up around myself for so many years. And so I think that matrescence, like I love the notion of there being a term for this. And I wish I knew about it at the time, because I think that people build up this idea about it's all about the baby, right? Even even in terms of when you're pregnant, you go to these doctor's appointments and they're checking your vitals and all these things, but it's really about the health of the baby. And then the minute you have the baby, it's like, great, if the baby's healthy, like, you know, God willing, the baby's healthy, great, okay. See you in six weeks. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> and that, right, exactly. And that's it. I mean, I was literally discarded from the hospital at 9.30 at night. My first daughter was born five and a half weeks early. I took her home at four and a half pounds and they discharged us at 930 at night in New York, New York City. There was no chance for a photo. There was no like beautiful, like coming home. I mean, it was the middle of December. It was cold and I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And that was kind of how this all started. And I, and I just think that like, I wish somebody told me at the time, like, this isn't just about how many ounces of milk your baby is going to take in the first few months or like hitting those milestones about her. Like your entire life is, is going to be redefined. Your priorities are going to be shifted. You're going to be questioning your purpose. You're going to be really like existentially changed by, yeah. this, by this change in your life. And, and I like just... A, there's like a period of mourning too, because I remember like sitting yes. on the couch holding this newborn baby. And I was like, oh my God, this is my life now. Like everything before that I enjoyed or you know, like, obviously this is dramatic, but like in that moment, I was like, anything it's before not, that. It's not. I just felt like it was the old me had to be completely gone and I wasn't ready to let go of that. I said that too. I said, I felt like I was in mourning of my old life 
but then I had such incredible shame for considering it that and yeah. saying that, that like, I was crying and saying that I just remember crying and saying that I missed my husband and he was sitting right next to me. Mm -hmm. And like, I just, we had a life, like we had our established routines. We had our priorities in the way that we chose to unwind and spend time together. And it just yeah. felt like that was just completely turned upside down. I mean, and I think from a career standpoint, I'll say this too. I mean, like I'm someone who like for better or worse, like probably for worse, I like deeply commingle my self-worth with my career. And it's, and I always have like, not to be like self-own, but it's so true. Like, and so for me, like, I felt like I was trying to be different people to so many different people. And I just wasn't willing to like embrace the change and own the fact that those changes were taking place. I was just like being a mother at home, but I spent all of my energy in that first year or two trying to convince everybody else in my life, but particularly people that I work with, that I was the same person. You bring up a good point there because I feel like when this term is so awesome and I too wish I knew about it when I had my, my oldest is 11 now. Because it really, when you add that mom to your list of roles in your life, it literally redefines every single other role. I feel like yes. with work, with your social life, with your husband, it, everything is going to be changed. And, you know, it would have been nice for somebody to tell me that <laughs> before I had kids. Well, but isn't there kind of this generic wisdom amongst women that... Like, I feel like, you know, like I've been to so many baby showers at this point, And I feel like as you gather the different generations of women, like there's kind of like a hush amongst the mothers who are there who kind of talk about this. But there's almost like this unspoken rule that we're not supposed to say that. And so I think that even if somebody did tell you, you could never, ever put this experience into words. So I don't I, and I feel like, you know, there's always that one person when you are pregnant who's like, oh, just wait. And like, I know we all kind of roll our eyes at that person, but like, I maybe have like, it's getting lost in the sauce. It's like, it's the delivery, not the message maybe. I don't know. But because I feel like there is, there are like whispers of people trying to say it. But even if we were allowed to shout it from the rooftops, I don't know that anybody would grasp it. I, I, I would agree with that to some extent. I think that it, it's very easy to, to, impart your lived experience on somebody else and but but it's another thing for it to like really resonate with them i mean i you know it's i also think there's like generational like there's I generation was say, yeah right, uh, i mean issues in terms of like how yeah. our parents generation treated motherhood i mean i i get a lot of from my mom who i know she understands that it's not the same now that it was then for an, for a number of reasons which we could go on all day about but I still find her saying, well, that's just motherhood. That's just how it is, you know? And, well, it's, and just... it's this sense too of like, well, that's what I had. So like, why shouldn't you have, why shouldn't you have it as bad as I did? And right. <laughs> Which is just like the generic boomer mantra. <laughs> it, it is the generic boomer mantra. Like I experienced this. So I just right. kind of live too. But like, I think that I, I will say like between my first and second child, I think it really depends also like who's in your village at the time, you know? When I had my first daughter, which is like really that main, that, that first experience with matrescence, even though I do believe that adding any child to your, to your family, like changes the dynamic entirely, but obviously most dramatically with the first child, I, I, I do believe that the fact that I didn't have any other friends with kids at the time was a real, like that, that really, really made it even more difficult because I really felt a little bit like ashamed for having these feelings. And I really didn't know who I could speak to about them. And I was just so exasperated trying to convince those friends of mine that like I was still here, that I hadn't changed. And I put so much effort into like, I remember, and I'm ashamed to even say this, but for the, for the sake of what we're doing here, like I will, I mean, I just remember trying to like convince people that I like didn't care about the baby or that I, that sounds like, disgusting to say. And I, I can't, I'm like getting upset thinking about it. But I just was so desperate for everybody to see me as the same person that I was because I didn't have anybody that would accept who I was becoming because it hadn't, it, it wasn't a part of their life. No, I totally relate to that. And I think my 
my approach was the opposite, that if I lean so hard into this person that I don't recognize and don't necessarily want to be, that maybe I'll become that person. And yeah, no, I totally relate. To yeah, that. that's that's like the right, exactly. Like we both were yeah. trying to to find to find out like find that healthy medium somewhere in yeah. there. I mean, it just it's it's just really it, it was just really, really hard. And, I, and I'll be honest, like I don't think I found my stride until I had my second child. I think I struggled with this the entire time between my between my first two, you know, between my daughters. I struggled How with it. Close are your girls? Three years. Three years okay. apart. Okay. Because I would agree with that too, but mine are 20 months apart. So I really didn't give myself a chance to like. Right. But that like, that's what simple. I mean, where I really leaned in. It was like, this is what we're doing now. This is our life. I have no control over it. No matter what I do, like what's done is done. There's no going back. And so cool. like, I'm just going in like balls to the wall and this is what we're doing. And I think, you know, I should have just like given myself a little bit more time. But again, like that was like the big story I was telling myself is like, this is who you are now. There is no going back. Well, you know, what's a good example of that? And I, I, I did a little bit of that in between, in between my daughters. I, the example would be that I, I always liked working out. I used to have like go to group fitness classes and things when I lived in the city. And I always just, I prioritized it. It was just important for my mental health um, and my physical health. And I had convinced myself after my first daughter was born that I didn't like I didn't deserve that time, that hour a day. I didn't deserve uh, a chance to go do that. And I told myself that in the form of like, well, what's it matter if I get in shape? Like I, 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 hadn't, I hadn't positioned it around mental health and about me doing something for me, but it was all about losing weight, losing baby weight. And like that, because that's such a focus, you know what I mean? Like that's such a incorrect focus. So how can we get back physically to the way we are? Not about like getting mentally back, to a place that you belong. Well, and I think using working out as just like a mental health necessity, I mean, that's really with it just in the last couple of years, I feel like that's come into consciousness. Like yes. when our kid, when we had babies, it was just like, like you said, it was all about baby weight. It wasn't like hundred percent needed for sanity. It, that was just hundred percent option. Yeah. And I realized, and I realized now that that actually had much deeper meaning when I said to myself, well, what's the point in losing baby weight if I'm just going to want to get pregnant again? And I know a lot of women who've said that. And But I think what they're really saying is like, well, what's the point in trying to figure out who I am in this moment because I'm going to make these sacrifices all over again very soon. And that's not like the right way to approach it. But I think that through like exercise for me, that was me saying like, I don't deserve it. And I, I'm I'm still in this like, lengthy period of sacrifice rather than viewing it as like, this is a new normal and we need to find a way for us all to get our needs met, including me. And, and I, I feel like I, I discovered that after my second daughter was born. It took until then. Totally. How do you personally think a lack of understanding and rec recognition of matrescence plays into like postpartum depression and anxiety? Because I feel like this is like so intertwined with the mental health aspect. It's entirely intertwined. I don't think enough people are asking about how, like, how the moms are feeling. I still think, even though we're, we're just starting to talk about this now, I mean, I, I try and make the point to ask a friend who has just had a baby. I say, but how are you? Like, we're all sitting here talking about the baby and how the baby's sleeping and what, how are you? What do you need? Like, I, I try and I say, like, what does the mother need? What can we do to support her? Um, and I, I, I think that this absolutely plays into mental health because, again, like, focus is just, it's just on the baby and it's not on us. And and I think that that can be incredibly isolating for a new mother. And with that, with that isolation, just comes shame because we're not discussing ways that you can kind of pull yourself out of those out of those deep dark feelings and i think we all have had them at some point in time and like it took like the reason we all still get so emotional about this topic is because like, we can access those feelings still and and I, I don't i don't wish them upon anyone have you encountered a friend family member new mother whatever relationship that is just like 
yeah, yeah, everything's great. No, I don't know what you mean. Everything's fine. Because I've I've had that where it's like, no, it's it's okay. You can really say it. But then I feel like I'm put in the role of like, well, you just don't like motherhood or you're trying to project your experience onto me. And it's almost like, I feel like I can't pull you out. Like you have to be ready to acknowledge it before we can talk about this. Like I can't pull you out of it. I can't, there's nothing I can say that can help. Like it's, because for me, it wasn't one moment. It was like a, the, you know, the totality of the circumstances. And so I think just maybe opening the door for those conversations is the only way. But I've had so many friends and family members where it's like, I can tell that you are putting on your happy face right now. And <laughs> like, don't do that for me. I get it. But they just, you can't. That's the way I try and be too. I, I just try and make myself available and make myself, for lack of a less cheesy term, a safe place for a friend who can, I, I want somebody to feel like they have somewhere they could say the things that they are telling themselves they can't say, that they can't say out loud, that they might be thinking in their head. I just think that like, we don't, and, it, and it's not just in that immediate period of that postpartum hormonal surge, that kind of like, you know, we hear more about that, right? That That is becoming more something that we're, we've normalized and are starting to talk about more and it's super important. But I think this concept of matrescence, the larger sweeping change goes beyond that acute period. This is about opening your life and really like, to me, it's about being comfortable with yourself as a mother and incorporating that into all the other things you have going on in your life and like being really proud and being really confident in the fact that like I am a mother and all these other things. So I think it goes beyond like that initial period. But yeah, I would agree with you that like this is deeply commingled with mental health. It's deeply commingled with all the, you know, discussion around postpartum depression and anxiety and all these things and just like being being a conduit for more open dialogue is like the best that best you can do for a friend, for sure. You know, I always like I had I've heard people say, you know, like I just I loved every second of having a newborn, be you know, like entering motherhood. I never had any depression or anxiety. And like I just I don't believe these people. I don't. Like I'm just I'm, <laughs> I'm just like, they're liars. Yes, right? They have to be <laughs> they're they're human. No. And but maybe there's like one percent of women who like just wanted to be a mother their entire life and just take to it so naturally. 1%. Like fine. A bell curve, I will give you the one percent. But <laughs> I just, I don't believe. Like, like, blessed, right? Like live, lap love. <laughs> <laughs> with the sign in their kitchen. What it, what's this mess? Like, I'm not blessing the mess. I have blessed the mess. Oh. And I just think, I, I think honestly, like I think that's the role of the patriarchy in all of this. Like women have yes. been programmed all their lives to want this, to be mothers. And yep. especially our generation, we've been told like, you can be a mom and have a successful career and like do all these things you can have it all and I think our mothers fed us that line as they were trying to make that a reality and I think they all saw that that's bullshit but it was too one, far gone to save us 100 <laughs> percent. I think that our generation was kind of fed this idea that we could have it all um, you do x y and z then you'll get the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that is that's okay it. follow the path follow the path yeah. like plug yourself into this template of success and you will be able to have the family. You will be able to have a career. Nobody talks about all the steps along the way, like the the complications of doing those things at the same time and really like, and and, and realizing it. And you're not going to realize it until it's happening to you because you never really kind of think it's going to happen to you. No, of course um, not. You never really think. You say to yourself, I mean, like, I, again, like I'm someone who like deeply and very like unhealthily commingled my self-worth with my job for a very long time. I wanted to be the person who was the last person in the office. And I and I wasn't like a good ally to other women. Like I wasn't. I was the first one to judge, the first one to say, well, it must be nice to leave at four o'clock every day to get on the train. Like I was the first one. And it's just, that came from my own, my own issues. But like, it's, it's wild when it happens to you, how quickly you realize that people are looking at you differently. 
in the office, that maybe the assignments you're getting aren't the same, that maybe like, and, and, and maybe on your end, like you don't even care anymore. Like maybe, maybe your priorities are shifting in terms of like, that was always very important to me. And maybe they're not as important. I'm desperate to run home and be with my baby who I haven't seen. And I've just been like staring at pictures of at my desk all day for the first four months I was back at work because we probably shouldn't be back at work four months after having a baby. <laughs> no, like, no. we just... The system is not designed for us to have it all. One, well, four months is so long for some people. Some people only yes. get you know, two weeks. And six right, weeks four and months. Like, four, yeah. Like four months is a blessing. And even that feels like, like you're just hitting a stride with oh, totally. Money. It's just, it's, it's a mess and our systems don't support us actually putting that into practice. You know, it's, it's very, it's just very interesting. I don't know. I, I look back at the time between like right after my first baby and right after my second baby. And like, I had told myself because I had been through it the first time to your point about like women who just are like, it's great. Everything's great. I had told myself after my second that I was like, I know what I'm doing here. We, this isn't my first rodeo. I'm going to crush. I'm going to crush this. And I had really like talked myself up and for the first six, seven weeks, like I was great. I was like riding a high. I was dealing with my crying toddler who was like pissed off that she had a sister. I was like doing the laundry. I was, I, I had it all covered. I was like staying up. I was breastfeeding longer than I had the first time. I had it all covered. And then one day I just crashed and I just lost it. Like complete middle of the night meltdown. And I realized like I didn't have it. I was putting on a show the whole time and my life was infinitely harder with a second child. And then I had to do that readjust. I had to have that readjustment all over again. So like to your point, I don't believe that anybody can fully adjust, you know, to having a baby without having some level of struggle, some, some self-reflection, some, you know, some growing pains in your life. And if so. you don't, you just must have all the help in the world. You must have a night nurse, a nanny. Yep. A chef, a house Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Beyonce has never experienced matrescence. No. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, Although know. maybe she has because, you know, like cre creatively speaking, it I feel like it does rewire your brain in some way. I Look, I'm sure that priorities... <laughs> Maybe her priorities shifted. You know, uh, who knows? Like, right. I mean, it and anybody can experience that, but it certainly is made easier when you have the resources to to really support that transition in your life. You know, it's, it was definitely, I, I'll say this, like our, our first child we had in New York City and the childcare system is like really wacky there. Like you have to, you kind of just find a nat, like there really aren't that many daycare centers. They're very long wait lists. You, you kind of have to find like word of mouth help somebody to come in your home. You know, you're going based off really like nothing, like the word of mouth of one other person. Hopefully it works out. Hope sometimes it doesn't. It's very, very disconcerting for a new mother if it doesn't work out. And then the second time around, we lived in the suburbs. We moved to New Jersey outside of New York City. We've got a little more physical space. We live in a house now. And our we sent our daughter to a preschool, like a like a daycare program that we knew was safe, credited, I got pictures during the day and like having that infrastructure and that like trust that I could trust somebody else to help did make a difference in helping me through that difficult, you know, patch. Yeah, that infrastructure and like safety net for new mothers is certainly lacking in our country. For sure. Mm, well, that's for sure. To say the that's least. <laughs> to, to say the least, yes. Did you see that? Did you see that viral tweet? I think her, oh, I forget her name. I think it was, her name's Meg. And she, she put up in her footer for her office, like her office footer was like, yes. please pardon, pardon my delay due to the lack of construct of, of, of reliable childcare in this country. <laughs> there might be a delay in my response because my kids are out of school for the summer and, and it went viral. And I, I get it. I feel that it's something that doesn't go, you know, doesn't go away in terms of, you know, us not having the infrastructure, like that doesn't get better as our kids get older. We still don't have it, but we just adapt to it better, I think. Right. I mean, out of necessity, you you do what you have to do. My kids. Right. Are, what trust do we have? 
<laughs> my kids are upstairs right now with a bowl of like greasy buttery popcorn on my white bed because that is like the best oh, like thoughts and prayers and that's like the best bribe i could give them to be quiet for an hour right now so we could do this because to to you know coordinate for an hour of silence because i can do most everything else with them around mostly but like for an hour of silence to record and takes a lot more. So, and like, it's not even worth it almost to coordinate that. So it's like, okay, this is what we got. This is what we I, have got. A funny, I have a funny story. So when I was in, when I was working in corporate law and I'd attend these mediations via Zoom and you kind of sit through a whole day mediation. Sometimes it doesn't go anywhere all day, but then you're getting to the end of, of the business day. You're getting to like five, six o'clock. And that's when people like, cut the BS. That's when everybody like gets down to business. We're talking about like, we could have, we could have been like dicking around all day. And then we get to the end of the day and everyone's talking numbers and it's every like five minutes, whatever. And that was always, it was always timed perfectly with when my children would walk through the door. And I always knew, and I'm like, all day we were sitting here in silence. I was like eating a salad, like we were taking breaks. And the minute we get into the nitty gritty was always when my kids would walk in from camp school and after whatever activity and they would just come barging down and I'm like this is not this is not the time <laughs> every <laughs> single time <laughs> it's just never that fail but what is that like old not even old that cliche saying we're supposed to work like we're not mothers and mother like we don't have a career or whatever it's mm -hmm. it's so true I don't really know yeah and I don't really know like how to even, and I've thought about this before because I've tried to be a good ally and mentor to women in, you know, in my profession who have, you know, had babies and, and say to them like when or how it gets better. And it's like, you just change. Eventually you just, like mm -hmm. I change in terms of like what I was willing to tolerate or what I was willing to sacrifice in terms of my children. Like I, it was at, at the beginning, you kind of view it like, well, no, I want to show everybody at the job that I'm still the same exact person. And then the only person that really loses is is me, like missing out on the time with my family, feeling like I'm living a lie, trying to tell everybody that my, you know, kids' time doesn't matter and whatever. And I don't really know like when that switches, but it switched for sure. Like the, in, you know, my last role, I was I was unapologetic about what I needed for my family. And ultimately, it was the reason that I ended up pivoting to go work with my husband because they wanted us back in the office four days a week. And I had been working from home due to the pandemic since my younger daughter was 11 months old. And I kind of got to raise her and work and have it all, I put in quotes, in a way that I never got to have with my first daughter. And I just wasn't willing to give that up. And I've never been so sure of anything in my life than when I said, like, nope. I'm not coming into the city four days a week. I'm not going to do it. That was, it was just not something I was willing to give up. Well, and I think that I almost wonder if that paradigm shift wouldn't have come for a lot of parents without the pandemic, without that kind of exposure. Because I think, and I think that's even another generational shift too, is that with our parents, it was work came first because that's what, you know, put the roof over your head and fed you and all of those things. And I saw a lot of that with my husband also, but somewhere over the last few years, he's seen it too, that like work doesn't give a shit about you. <laughs> like the people at home do. And so those are the people that you should be prioritizing. And I yes. wonder if that the pandemic almost accelerated that shift too. I definitely think it did. I think we all were forced to really like have a bit of a self-reckoning about what's most important and really who is valuing us. Why are we placing work on a pedestal over our family when at the end of the day, you know, we were in, I mean, everybody had a different pandemic experience, but I think we all, to some extent, at one point in time, felt like we were living through a life or death situation. Um, or maybe we all, a lot of us felt that way, especially like in the Northeast. I mean, when, when this all really started, we all really felt like we were in imminent danger. And that creates a little bit of PTSD and it definitely creates, you know, it, 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 it causes you to really reevaluate and say to yourself, like, why, why did I care so much about 
all the, why did I, or not even so much why did I care? Because I, I, I think that that's maybe too extreme, but why did I place such a, such high value on that over my family and my loved ones, which are tantamount to all of that? I think the pandemic definitely accelerated that shift. And, and I think for a lot of people, I mean, read whatever think pieces you want that are probably being put out by like a commercial real estate like investors saying people love being back in the office. Like read whatever you want, but everybody I know, <laughs> people love me. Like, collaboration, you know. But I think I think most people like really, really like once they've seen that they can live a more balanced life that really incorporates their family and 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 also things that they love to do. Like that you have more time for the other things that add value to your life. Like I think it's a hard you can't. It's hard to go back once you've seen it. It's hard to unsee it. Yeah, when you can see how much you can do with two extra hours in the day when you're not commuting, you <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. good luck. I mean, having that time back in my life was when was the inspiration for starting my newsletter. That's kind of how this all began. I started my newsletter like late 2020 as a concept, early 2021. And I was thinking about all the ways my life had changed over the past year and all the struggles that we all went through in trying to like work and live and exist and care give like all at the same time. But I was trying to look for all the positive that came out of it and say to myself, like, look at all the things you've started doing for yourself again, just given the time, the time that you've gotten back. And I started to realize that all these small victories in my life really add up and really were, you know, rebuilding the self-worth that I'd kind of knocked down uh, in those first you know, several years of motherhood. I mean, having that space, having that time really helped me see things differently. And that's, that's the way I approach what I'm, what I try and write about each week. I love that so much. And your newsletter is so good. Thank you, you also interweave pop culture in there, like Scandaval, which you know, we all love. You know, I love a good Bravo scandal. <laughs> I love it. You've been in the DMs about it. I can't help myself. And although I feel like I've kind of like oversaturated, like I have reached my peak saturation on Scandal. Like, I don't yeah. know what else they could throw at me to make it any, to like, nothing's going to shock me now. No. Yeah, no, definitely not. I, I definitely need like a Scandal break. <laughs> I need a palate cleanser. Too. Break too. My husband said to me, not to get totally on topic, my husband said to me last week, he's like, I've had enough. I cannot, I cannot live through you living through a reality star scandal any longer <laughs> because I think you're like embodying this and in, in you're like internalizing it into your own life. And I, she's like, I still can't take it. It's stressful and it's really negative. I'm like, is it? It's fun. But then I was like, he sounds no, negative. negative. <laughs> Like, I think you're the negative one. Like, it was a program. Oh, it's too funny. Well, in this, like, finding yourself and, you know, finding yourself in motherhood, do you think that matrescence ends? I don't know if it ends. That's such a good question. I mean, I think that we are constantly redefining ourselves as people. We're constantly in a, in a quest of self-discovery. If you allow yourself to be, if you allow yourself to be in perspective right. about your life, then you are constantly discovering new things and, and looking at and, you know, the ways that you evolve as a person. But I do feel like matrescence itself, I don't think it ends, but I think you reach a point where you, you can, if you allow yourself to reach a point where you can say, I've, I've changed my life for the better around like who I am today as a mother. Like I, I am comfortable with who I am today, mm -hmm. mother and I am a mother and these other things. And I think like it doesn't end, but you do reach a point of acceptance if, if you can get there. I mean, I, I hope for everybody that they can get there. I know it took me probably five years of being a mother to get there, but I, I am, you know, completely comfortable with the way that I choose to live my life in terms of how I balance work, motherhood, and the space that I make for myself. But I think it depends on the person. And only you know, you only you know inside whether you're comfortable with the balance that you've struck for yourself, with the way that you choose to define and live your life. Like only you know when it's enough. I really don't think it does. I because I think as your kids 
continue to grow and change and hit new milestones and, you know, like different age levels as they hit adolescence. I think you are so intertwined with their journey that I think there's no way to separate it almost. And so I think you continue to experience those bumps and changes with them. That's so true. It forces you to then redefine yourself again. That's so true. You know, it's one of those things where you say, oh, it gets better to like new moms when they're younger. And it's like, no, things just change. Like things don't different. Yeah, things things are always cut. You just have to be ready. I I guess like, I guess what I was trying to say was that like, if you get yourself to a place where you can sustain change, you can roll with the punches better. You can roll with, you can roll with it. But I completely agree with your sentiment about like, there is no winning parenthood. There is no no winning. Like things are constantly evolving and your life is constantly changing as your kids experience new challenges and, and go through their own life. So I completely agree with that take too. These damn kids. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? I know, right? But it's so true. And I mean, like, we just went through a big change this year. My seven-year-old went to public school for the first time. She'd always been in the preschool with my little one. And we had, like, you know, our little preschool group of friends. I mean, it's a big change when your kids step into the wide world of, of yeah, public school. That, and, that's and, a big one. Huge. Yeah, and they're not necessarily, like, I think we think milestones as, like, they're crawling or they're walking. Like, they the milestones change and i i hate i hated to hear that old thing you know whatever they parents say of like little kids little problems big kids big problems because when i had little kids and they weren't sleeping that was a huge problem but now yes. that my kids are getting older it's like oh these problems are a lot bigger they're just different types of problems that i can't necessarily help with and like at some point they have to figure out these big problems on their own and it's just it's like, oh, here we are again in a whole other shitty place where I have to I, I completely, I completely agree. I mean, I feel like the acute problems are much easier to deal with. Like my kids, my girls don't fight, really. They don't, they're not like getting into things that they shouldn't get into. They're not like opening cabinets that they shouldn't open. But I'm trying to teach my seven-year-old how to be a good human. Like, right, like that's <laughs> fucking so hard. hard. That is hard. I'm trying to teach her about gratitude, which is not easy in, in a world of, of instant gratification, which right. is so different than the way that we grew up. They just don't know. Like, they, they don't know how to stop consuming, like, the right. kid, like kids now. Like, they think, my, my four-year-old said, and I, oh, I keep thinking about this, and I have to find a way to write about this, that my four-year-old keeps going in her little voice. She sounds like Elmo. She goes, like, she'll, she'll stain something. She'll go, that's okay, Mama. You can get a new one. And I'm mm-hmm. like, Oh, mm-hmm. no, they can't get into it. But I don't know where, like, is it because they see the Amazon boxes, like, rolling through, and it's a home, they're going to camp. We better click the buy yep, yep. and snuggle. And, like, they're just living a very different childhood than we had. And so, like, teaching the lessons that maybe we learned as a kid at, at, at some point, like, they can't be taught the same way and for it to right. resonate. So the I world's agree. not the same. Yes. Right. Okay. It's a well, cl- you need to come back for that episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely definitely oh my god you know it's it's just it's it's funny i brought about about scarcity marketing like earlier this like in the winter or something about like me buying these like dumb sweatshirts that were getting like dropped like the drop of these limited edition sweatshirts and like why and i brought up two of them because i like I, I was so excited that they were in stock when i like clicked through at exactly three o'clock and they were like the worst sweatshirts ever like and now i have two of them but i was thinking about i'm like I was teaching these lessons to my daughter and I'm like, hold on, mommy just needs to pull over the car so I can buy these sweatshirts that are part of this drop. Like what? <laughs> what kind of are we living in? But anyway, I, 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 I'm willing to admit my part. Oh, I, I, I definitely me. relate to that. <laughs> completely. <laughs> Send it, send it to Daryl, right? right. <laughs> I mean, look, my something about her shirt. <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Oh, as soon as those came out, I was like, need that. <laughs> yeah, and they're 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 very they're very visually appealing. I need one too. I'm jealous. Well, thank you so much for joining us and jumping in on this conversation with us. We loved having your perspective. Oh, it was such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Will you tell our audience more about your newsletter and how they can sign up for it? 
Yes, sure. Our Tiny Rebellions is on Substack. So if you just Google Our Tiny Rebellions on Substack, it will pop right up. And you can also find me on Instagram and on Twitter at Average Joelle. If you like what you just heard, and we hope you do, you can find more of us online at www.okistmoms.com. We're also on all social media platforms, Pinterest, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at okistmomsblog. Or if you want to, you can send us an email at hey at okistmoms.com.